I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Welcome to today's podcast. We are taking a break from the historical timeline to bring you an interview that I have been excited for and anticipating for months now. Today, I sit down with Jana Reese, the author of The Next Mormon's Book, and Benjamin Knoll, the data scientist who helped author the study and the book, in order to discuss the future of Mormonism based on data collected in this first-of-its-kind snapshot study. It's a bit of a long interview, but it's well worth the listen if you're willing to generously give us your time. I'll have some concluding thoughts after the interview, so be sure to stick around after Jana and Benjamin sign off. Without further ado, here we go. Jana Reese is a current columnist for Religion News Service. She holds a degree in religion from Wellesley College and Princeton Theological Seminary, as well as a PhD in American Religious History from Columbia. She's written many well-known and award-winning books, including The Prayer Wheel, Flunking Sainthood, and The Twibble, or The Twible. I'm not sure which I she borrows from, whether it's the Twitter or the Bible, but that's exactly what you think it is. It is the Bible in tweets. And she is here to talk about her most recent book, The Next Mormons. Jana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me having me. Benjamin Knoll is the John Marshall Harlan Associate Professor of Politics at Center College. He graduated summa cum laude with a BA in political science from Utah State University and holds an MA and PhD in political science from the University of Iowa. His research has been published in multiple peer-reviewed political science journals, and he also co-authored She Preached the Word Women's Ordination in Modern America, published in 2018. And Benjamin was the data scientist who collaborated with Jana to make sense of the next Mormons survey, which birthed the book that we'll be discussing today. So, Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. So in the interest of transparency and, of course, contextualizing not only our conversation, but the data that we're going to be discussing today, I'd just like to ask a brief question to both of you. Jana, are you a current, former, or never Mormon? I am a current Mormon. Okay. And Ben, same question? I am a current Mormon who is one of the millennials who doesn't quite fit the boxes that we usually use to describe stereotypical Mormons in the United States. I feel like we'll probably be discussing that quite a bit today. Um, as I'm also uh, I'm a former uh, Mormon, grew up in in Utah, who doesn't believe in the church, and I see many many issues with the church, and we're going to be discussing a lot of those today. And I've been out of the church for over a decade now, so thank you. I I just think that it's important to get those biases out in front because those biases and transparency about that is going to be crucial to understand today's show. So I've prepared far more questions than we have uh, time to get to today. I have questions not only about the data, but about how the data is presented. So I'm elated to have both the presenter of the data, Jana, as well as the parser of the data, Ben, on to discuss all of these and to field some of these questions. But first, if you don't mind, I'm going to quickly digress about this book. This book, The Next Mormons, is absolutely required reading. It's an amazing book. And I would argue that this book, coupled with Greg Prince's new book on LGBTQ plus issues in the church, are absolutely the most important Mormon culture books published of the 2010s. The data that you two compiled and the accessible way that you presented it, Jana, it, it was an interesting read from top to bottom. It was wonderfully illuminating. And honestly, it reveals many powerful trends existing in Mormon culture today. It's my opinion that the next Mormons will go down as the greatest meter stick of Mormon culture of the early 21st century. And I'm physically incapable of recommending this book highly enough. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wow. That's quite a framing. I'm not, <laughs> this is, there's no smoke and mirrors here. It is truly an important book and I loved reading it and I loved rereading it to prepare for this, this interview. Um, but I want to get at the roots of this. Let's stock the foundation and start with Jana here. What was the next Mormon survey and what was the genesis of the survey? So the survey was fielded in 2016 and it had 1,696 total respondents of whom about two thirds were currently identified Latter-day Saints and a third were former. Um, 
And as far as the genesis of the project, this has been years in the making. I started in 2011 and 2012 doing preliminary interviews for a book that I thought at that time would be about Mormon childhood and adolescence. I didn't grow up Mormon, and so I was very interested in the experiences of people that I knew who had that, you know, those kind of sets of very different cultural experiences of growing up LDS. And so I was really curious about it and started doing interviews. But along the way, I became even more interested in what was happening to those people as young adults and definitely marking with anecdotal observation that it certainly seemed that more Mormons were leaving the church than had been the case even a decade ago and wanted to, to find out, you know, is that actually a, an accurate national observation? Is that simply just based on where I live and the social um, media affinity groups that I'm part of? Or is this real? Is this really happening uh, on a wider scale? And is it? <laughs> I guess that's kind of the thesis of the book, isn't it? It is. Um, so we have a number of, you know, different data points to triangulate, including from Pew, um, our study from the General Social Survey. And in fact, the, the GSS data is pretty interesting because it's aggregated from 1973 to the present. And you can analyze people, as Darren Shurkant has done, by their birth cohort. So people who were born before 1943 had a very, very high rate of retention in the church, of still being active in the church as adults, um, going from like 80% to about 72 or 73%. And then it's pretty steady for all of the baby boomers. And then with Gen X, it goes down to 62 and a half percent. And then with millennials, mm -hmm. it kind of goes off a cliff. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a small number of millennials who are canvassed by the GSS. But there are enough other data points, including some leaked data from the church's own internal research division that would indicate that those numbers are pretty accurate. So I want to send this question over to Ben then, because this I feel like this is important. And there are many points throughout the book that you say that this is something that was asked in the Pew Research Study, or this is a question that was tailored from the PRRI or from uh, various other research institutes, the GSS and whatnot. Uh, how hard was it to craft a Mormon flavored version of these general kind of population and culture studies? And, you know, to tailor all of this larger grand study about just specifically millennial Mormons? That is a good question. Uh, fortunately, as social scientists, we shamelessly can stand on the shoulders of giants and those who have come before us. <laughs> and right. the Pew Research Center and PRRI and other public serving public research groups have spent many, many years working with sociologists of religion and political scientists and other social scientists to get down a really good science of asking um, poll questions that are designed in such a way as to elicit the most accurate answer as possible. And so instead of reinventing the wheel, we just went straight to them to see what sorts of questions that they ask. And several of them, we just literally just pulled the, the, the stem and the options for the questions right over into this one, which by the way, is not plagiarism in this, <laughs> in this particular situation. That's a standard <laughs> practice in social science survey research. Um, they're not they're not copyrighted um, by that. But it, it enables us also not only to get more accurate answers, but then also be able to draw more direct comparisons with those other external surveys to be able to see what kinds of answers we got. And and, and that really helps calibrate to, to see are the answers we're getting generally in line with those from the other surveys, which helps add confidence to our own survey's accuracy. And on this one, there were some, uh, on a lot of key questions, there were general um, correlations with what we see in other surveys, which which helped boost the confidence that we were getting a, a, a good sample. Okay. And the way that the information is presented is fantastic because you can have a ton of raw data and political scientists can see information in data that uh, lay people cannot see. And I am not a, a political or data scientist. Um, I'm not a scientist really of any right. So having the information packaged in such a way that this book presents it is crucial to translate that data and all of that crucial information to a lay audience. And the book itself is broken down into 11 chapters and three different parts. 
and we have part one, foundations. Part two is changing definitions of family and culture. And then part three, passages of faith and a doubt. So, Jana, I want to ask you a little bit about how you decided to present this information. What was your thought process going into this and how kind of it broke down and what decisions you had to make in the writing process in order to translate all of this raw survey data into a format that people who know nothing about Mormonism are never born in it and have never read a book about it can pick up and understand from cover to cover? Well, you've just highlighted my main goal in writing the book, which was to have it be accessible. You know, there are so many really good quality research studies about religion in America that nobody else can understand unless they have a degree in social science. And I think that's a, a travesty. It is very important that people be presented with information in a way that is accurate, but also highly readable. And so speaking primarily as an editor, it was important to me that I would be able to include not only the data and present it, but also the personal stories uh, of people's lives. So in addition to the pool of respondents that I spoke about, I separately interviewed 63 other people, mostly millennials, but not exclusively, and had a you know an in-depth 90-minute to two-hour conversation with them about different aspects of their spiritual lives, their family life, their sexual development, lots of different things. And so those stories are woven throughout the book in a way that I hope makes the research more human. In your introduction, you discussed three, what you called three indispensable elements of belief. And I hope that you can tell us what these kind of are, or maybe expound on these. You said number one is orthodox belief. The second is an accepted code of behavior. And then third, and you spend a bit of time on this, even though it's a a far more vague type of uh, theoretical concept, you said is transformative religious experience. Can you expound a little bit on those and why you picked those three elements out as the indispensable elements of belief? Yes. So belief, behavior, and belonging are kind of the three Bs of uh, social science and religion. So we can analyze what people say about their beliefs on a survey or in an interview. We can talk about their behaviors, which is almost entirely self-reported because, you know, no one's following them around to find out if they are, in fact, keeping the word of wisdom as they say they are. We, we are relying on what they say about their own behavior. And then finally, this kind of squishier third thing, transformative religious experience, belonging, sense of, of commitment and community. Um, also in that category are some questions that we took from Pew. I mean, as Ben stated, social science does this a lot where we are trying out survey questions that have been utilized by previous research, but in a different context with a new population. So some of those questions are, you know, how, how often do you feel close to God? Do you feel at one with the universe? That sort of thing. And Mormonism really excels in, well, in all of those categories, by comparison with the general population, I mean, I think it's important to state at the outset that even though we do see this pretty significant drop off in behavior, particularly with millennials, um, compared to non LDS millennials, they're very religious. Mormons as a whole, compared to the general population, are highly orthodox and um, also behaviorally conforming to most of the standards of the faith. So tithing, word of wisdom, church attendance, etc. So yes, I guess that's a good takeaway from all of it. Mormonism does pretty darn well with all three of those categories. And the one that that squishier one at the end, which is transformative religious experience, I think, particularly in the personal interviews came through very clearly that a lot of people had significant spiritual experiences in their Mormon lives, whether those were enough to keep them in the church uh, based on you know how they felt politically or whether they felt that they fit in, that's another question. But they did score pretty highly on these questions of um, feeling close to God. So then this question, or this book then, it sounds like it is uh, basically the treatise, the explanation, 
or not maybe the explanation, but the exploration of the data that underlies the millennial exodus from Mormonism. And there's an oft touted statistic that half of millennials are leaving the church right now, which is quite powerful. But you also use data from Gen Xers as well as the boomer and silent generation cohort. And oftentimes in many of your metrics, you are looping together the boomers and the silent generation because there was such, you know, little, little data, little respondent from them. Um, Let's let's talk about that, because that's a pretty startling number. If half of the millennials are leaving the church and let's throw this over to Ben, um, that's a pretty terrifying prospect for a church that relies on retention, especially what we might call a high demand religion like Mormonism. So at the end of the day, that half statistic, that half of millennials leaving, that's a fairly accurate statistic, isn't it? Well, it's it's actually even worse than that um, in some ways, because that statistic, which is the GSS, uh, is provisional in that millennials are still pretty young. You know, if you're looking at baby boomers having retained roughly three quarters of their adherence, most of their lives are over, right? Sorry, apologies apologies to any baby boomers in the audience, but (laughs) millennials still have a long time to make this decision about whether to stay in their childhood religion. And so it's pretty significant that so many have left so far. That's not to say, and they they also have a lifetime of tithing to give to the church that is not going to be present. Well, that's true, and a lifetime of children that they may have and not bring to church as well. So it's it's not just their generation, but but perpetuating from one generation to the next. Uh, and I think that that's an important thing that the church seems to be quite concerned about. Fertility patterns in American culture are down; they're still higher among Mormons than they are in the national population. I just wrote a religion news service column about this actually with some of the stats. Um, But it's definitely true that Mormons are having smaller families than they used to. And that makes a difference as the church is thinking institutionally about what its next programs are going to look like. Which I think is quite interesting as well. And I want to explore this. We'll probably be exploring this a bit today is this book, even though it was you know published at the end of 2018, we're recording this in mid 2019. There are a few data points that um, that show that this book is has become obsolete almost immediately after it was published. And of course, I'm thinking about the the anecdotal data that you used to, to help substantiate the survey data uh, when it comes to women's roles in the endowment ceremony. Mm. That was just changed as of early 2019. Uh, The November 2015 policy, the exclusion policy concerning LGBTQ individuals has been softened since this book was published. So there are a few things that have happened within the church already as of 2019 that show that this book uh, was pointing out some very important trends that are causing a lot of pressure on the church and have now come to a point that they have changed, which I thought was quite remarkable as well. Well, it's great. I, I do want to point out that it's not because of this book that those changes were made. I've been asked that question exactly. several times. And, you know, first of all, change at the church level appears to happen quite slowly. This book was only published in March of 2019. So, you know, the fact that temple ceremony changes were made in January of 2019 obviously is not due to this book. But what it is due to, I think, is that this book is pointing out something that the church's own research has also shown, which is that many women felt uncomfortable in the temple and felt diminished in the temple. Certainly. So let's also discuss this because this is uh, this kind of plays also into the profound spiritual experiences. This you know squishier third category you spoke to earlier. Um, one point that keeps coming back around and around in the book is that um, Mormonism seems to appeal to educated people, or maybe that is the putting the cart in front of the horse. Maybe it's the Mormon culture encourages. Uh, people to get educations. And that is quite interesting as well, because higher education seems to correlate negatively with a spiritual experiences, you know, these profound spiritual, uh, transformative spiritual experiences that your your third category seem to correlate with less education or that, that people who are less educated tend to have more of those experiences. So I want to kind of discuss how that data is parsed out. And, and maybe we can look into some kind of explanations of why it seems that Mormons are just more educated than possibly some other, you know, competitor uh, religions. Ben, do you want to take this one? Sure. So this one, I think it's important to 
put a uh, wider context on it. Um, United States Mormons are not unique in this. Um, it's, it's, it's a popular misconception that as people get more educated, they tend to drop out of religion at greater rates, which may be true worldwide, but at least in the United States, it's, it's the other way around. It's people with more education, higher socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera, that tend to be more active and consistent participants in religious communities in the United States, people with fewer socioeconomic resources. And there's a, a variety of reasons for it. One of them just being the, the, the resources to be able to be in one place for a long amount of time to develop ties with a congregation, to not have to work three jobs on the weekend that would prevent them from making it to church services. Um, those who are relatively better off are generally more stable, more consistent, and have those resources to be able to participate more frequently. So that's not unique to Mormons at all. Um, but I think it's important, too, when we talk about education to make a distinction between, say, a college, like a bachelor's degree education, and then, say, post-graduate uh, professional or academic um, training of some kind or another. Even then, we find in the survey that going to um, a postgraduate program in a professional program like law school or medical school is also correlated with a higher likelihood of just staying and attending and being active in those types of things. It's the small slice of people who pursue um, post uh, graduate academic studies in the humanities <laughs> that tend to be associated with a loss of literal belief. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Women especially. Yeah. Yes, yes, for women especially. Um, but it's important to keep in mind, too, that that's, that's a small slice of everybody, right? We're talking, you know, 1% or less from, from everyone else. For the most part, getting a college degree is associated with a higher likelihood of being active and retention and all that kind of stuff. And that does seem to drop off with the higher educated post uh, postgraduate degrees uh, when it comes to uh, women, right? Is that correct, Jenna? Yes. Although, as Ben said, I think it's important to recognize that that's a very small subsample of the overall sample. And so the margin of error is pretty high. Still, it's pretty interesting that it seems that certain kinds of advanced degrees for women correlate actually with leaving the church. And uh, that's just something to watch for future study. I want to also uh, parse out a little bit of the data too, because there's uh, the the people who leave the church, you know, and, and we have this 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 cascade of millennials who are leaving the church right now. But there are also the doubters who remain, and that's a sub chapter or a subsection in chapter one of the book. And if you'll permit me a brief reading, I'd like to discuss these statistics very briefly. What are the shared characteristics, if any, of those who doubt the church's teachings but still identify as LDS? Given the higher percentage of young adult Mormons who have left the church, it seems logical to assume that a higher percentage of millennial doubters are still in the pews, but that's not actually the case. And I found that quite interesting. Uh, here are the stats to back that up. The level of doubting among Mormons is stubbornly identical from one generation to the next, 17% across all age groups. Nor do we see any major differences by race or gender. Factors that do make a difference are education, as we saw earlier, those lacking a college degree are less orthodox, and marital status. Mormons who are divorced or separated are more than twice as likely to be doubters as those who are married, 28 versus 12%. When it comes to politics, independents are more likely to identify as doubters than either Republicans or Democrats, 31 versus 13 and 20 percent, respectively. So we have a number of factors that are kind of played into this, but there are people who doubt the church, but still keep going back, still keep attending. And I wonder how what percentage we could consider of millennials that are staying in the church, but they are staying there for possibly social reasons, possibly family reasons, possibly reasons that don't have much to do with the church's, you know, high demand theology and doctrine. Um, how do we kind of deal with that information? Well, you know, the, the number is pretty stubbornly consistent from one generation to the next. As you pointed out in this reading, it's uh, just under one in five people who are still identifying as Latter-day Saints. These are not the former Mormons. This is the current Mormon sample uh, who say that they have at least a moderate degree of doubt. So roughly one in five people sitting in the pews um, is going to be having a doubt of two, maybe more. And as far as motivation, we cannot assess that 
with these survey questions. So I think your question is great and very interesting, but that's not something that we can simply, uh, we can speculate about, but we cannot tell you definitively why they continue to stay if they have doubts. And I suppose I want to jump in here too, just to say once again, within the wider context, that's not unusual in the United States at large. Um, There's survey evidence shows that like people in evangelical Christianity, Catholicism, or other Protestant denominations, there's also a, it's not a huge group, but there are those who doubt the existence of God who just aren't really Orthodox believers in the traditional sense, but do find value in in participating in a religious community and show up and are in the pews every week. So Mormons, once again, fit the, the national trends in that aspect. One thing that I thought was quite interesting is the amount of data you collected concerning missionaries. And when it comes to people serving missions, when it comes to people not serving missions, when it comes to people leaving their missions early and people completing and having a full successful 18 month or two year mission. And this is posed basically, uh, this is chapter two, the missionary experience. And this is basically what you might consider the missionary effect. And my question uh, concerning this is there's, you know, when people were reflecting back on their experiences on the mission, and this this was consistent with current members as well as former members, uh, people did look on their mission in hindsight with a great deal of positivity. Very rarely was it ever presented that people had any sort of qualms or trouble with their time uh, in missionary service. I'm curious, it was during your data collection, and this may have come out in interviews or in anecdotal information that you've collected, what about the people who regret their missions? Uh, People who serve their mission, then they come to an understanding or realization that the church is not true, and then they have this feeling like they've done somebody a disservice because they've sold them a lie. They want to go back to wherever they serve their mission and... Uh, you know, tell everybody what they've learned about the church history, about polygamy, about race issues, about whatever it is that caused them to leave the church. Um, did you really find much to uh, much data behind people who regretted their mission service? We have not parsed the data that way. We could do that, which would be interesting to see how those people who had a, a negative experience on their mission now look at Uh, other aspects of church theology and practice. One thing I'd like to point out is that we had in both samples people who had served a mission but had a negative experience. But in both samples of current and former Mormons, they were the extreme minority, even in the former Mormon sample, which was very fascinating. Um, I would point out that that's a small number because most people, our median age for leaving the church was 19. That's actually very typical for leaving religion in America So most of the people in the former Mormon survey had not served a mission at all. So we're already talking about a small minority within that population. And then this even much smaller minority of people who had a negative experience and are in that former Mormon population. Um, We probably don't have enough of those to make a robust sample size to draw from just from that group. I also found it startling that you said that um, because of the church's focus and and in the you know past few decades their insistence on uh, you know the, shifting the culture towards more mission service uh, that the highest percentage of the groups surveyed that did serve missions or or have served missions was fifty five percent and that was millennials that was quite surprising to me. Yes, we've seen a rise in missionary service in every generation particularly among women. To, uh, to put some, uh, some meat on the bones of that, um, in 2002, the church created, uh, they basically uh, raised the bar for missionary service, and they called it Preach My Gospel, which you know standardized the curriculum for it. Um, and that increased the number of missionaries. But then by 2012, when they lowered the missionary age, they had somewhere around 80,000 active missionaries out in the field at that time. And that was, you know, that was kind of a, uh, an influx because at that time they had a, basically a three year span that people were out on the missions uh, when they changed the age immediately for a very brief time. And now it's settled back down to about 67,000 people. Um, And it's just interesting that the highest percentage who have served missions are indeed millennials. But it also seems millennials were much had a much higher likelihood of returning early and that they were quicker to distance themselves from the rhetoric of you come back in a coffin or you come back honorably. 
Um, so how do we kind of understand that data as well, that millennials are indeed stalwart members of the church, even though they're the greatest numbers who are leaving at the, the current time? Yes, that is complex. Um, it's okay, true, both of those are yeah. true, that we are seeing uh, more, millenni- more millennials serving a mission than any prior generation, but we are also seeing more people today coming home early than we've seen in previous generations. So those things are happening simultaneously, and I find that very interesting. This is something, it's, I don't know that we can substantiate it with specifically for with the survey data, but just anecdotally speaking, and of course, you know, so take it what it's worth, a grain of salt. Um, in my experience as a college professor, I see students coming in, the students who are now starting in college are now post-millennials. They're now the Gen Z generation coming in. And so I see a lot of very young millennials and also those who are Gen Z. And um, a lot of the research on this age group of people is talking about um, the higher than average degree of just um, mental health issues, anxiety issues, like all of these kinds of things that students are coming into. And there's a, a variety of societal explanations for that. We won't go into it. But just the sheer fact that that's a distinguishing characteristic of this age group, we see it here at college in terms of just counseling services and um, accommodations that are made for students and all that to help them be successful with their learning. I can't help but think that those kinds of issues are also influencing the way that missions are going and being administered and all that kind of stuff um, up at the macro level. My guess is, and I have no idea, this is just a pure guess, is that letting missionaries be able to call home once a week as opposed to twice a year may have something to do with that. Just the idea of managing anxiety in a younger generation and helping them be more mentally stable and and those kinds of things. And perhaps some of the other changes in the missionary program as well. Um, Again, I don't want to stretch more confidently than I can say with evidence, but that's, that's a, that's a hunch, a hypothesis that I have about one factor that may be affecting that. Interesting. So I want to move next to chapter three, that is rites of passage in the LDS temple, because I thought that this was quite interesting. And we're going to deal a fair amount in this chapter with the way that the, the way that women are perceived in the temple endowment ceremony, especially prior to 2019, before this change came along. And I want to use as an example, and and this speaks to the expertise of how well this book is written, because there are so many people in here. There's Ellis, there's Marianne, there's uh, Carrie Ann. I mean, there, there's so many people who are used as examples um, that that you use to basically put a human face to the data. And this is somebody who I'd like to fixate on for a second. This is Carrie Ann, because Carrie Ann was uncomfortable and she was frightened when going through the temple ordinance for the first time. She quote, felt robotic and small with the language and the rituals that were in the temple. And she basically was set to get married in the temple the next week. But the first time that she went through with her and her fiance, she had a panic attack. She broke down in the parking lot of the temple afterwards, and she didn't know who she could talk to. She never wanted to go back to the temple. She was completely shaken up by the temple ceremony. Now, this description of Carrie that Carrie Ann had here, this experience, this is not typical because the survey data found overwhelmingly that people considered their temple experience, especially their t- first temple experience, to be a very positive spiritual experience to them and very important to their spiritual journeys. But I thought that she was quite a, an interesting case study in all of this. Uh, because she basically told her fiance she never wants to go back to the temple. And they went back after, you know, the week they got married there. And then she, when she tried to talk to a friend about her discomfort in the temple ceremony, she was condescended. She was talked down to. And then eventually, because she was uncomfortable with all of this, she eventually pulled away from the church. And I want to read just a brief passage that explains how hard it can be to communicate about the temple ritual. It says, this is on page 52, given these patterns, it is difficult to admit to not understanding or worse, understanding but not enjoying the temple experience. Your first temple experience in a culture that speaks about it in such guarded and eulogistic ways. This is something that's tough to deal with, and when it comes to people who went through temple prep classes, I believe it was men who found the temple prep classes more uh, suitable, more helpful to them than it was uh, women who responded to this, Um, but the temple ceremony in and of itself uh, seems like it's 
it can be in some ways a divisive issue. So how do we kind of wrap our minds away around how the rites of passage in the the temple itself is, especially when millennials are reacting to this? You know, this was a fascinating bit of research because I didn't see in the data what I was expecting to see. I was expecting to see that millennials would have a higher rate of reporting that they felt uncomfortable in the temple than earlier generations. And not only was that not true, it was actually slightly the other direction. So baby boomers, silent generation members were a little more likely to report having had a negative first experience at the temple than millennials, which was very interesting. And and the vast majority of people who are still in the church say that they had a positive first experience at the temple, which was much higher than I was expecting to see as well. So that was very interesting to me. Um, As far as the preparation thing I think is important. You know, the temple prep classes did not get underway until the mid to late 1970s. And so many of those older respondents in our survey who went to the temple when they were in their 20s didn't have that class. They didn't have much of any experience. And they had the highest rate of reporting having not felt prepared for the temple. So uh, when we asked people a question of how they felt they had received the best preparation. Was it from a local church leader? Was it from your parents, a friend, a book you read? Um, they were The older members were more likely than any other generation to say that they didn't feel prepared at all. So it was a very interesting correlation wow. between preparation and having a good experience. So that's one takeaway from the data. As far as gender goes, um, based on the interviews, which again is a separate you know, group of people than the respondents to the survey data. Um, The interviews, women had qualifications. They had reservations about the temple. Some of them had positive experiences overall, but probably an equal number or more had some aspect of the temple that made them uncomfortable. That didn't come through in the data. So it was interesting that women in oral history interviews were more likely to talk about problems that they had than men were whether that was simply the truth or whether that was the dynamic of men not wanting to tell me as a woman researcher about the problems that they had with their garments, for example, or with gender roles in the temple, it's hard to say. I also found it quite remarkable that millennials are the most likely to hold temple recommends, or if you're taking a random sample size, but they're also the most likely to have let that temple recommend a lapse. They're the most likely to have ever had a temple recommend than previous generations, but the most likely to have let it lapse. Yes. Okay. And it sounds it's almost like the the more than anything, millennials are maybe just using that as, you know, get entry into the the, you know, the buildings so that they can attend their friends' weddings, so that they can, you know, what whatever the case may be, that they got the temple recommend for that purpose, but that they are not actively using it in returning over and over to the temple. We don't know that from the data. Okay. The, the, the motivations about whether they're attending weddings or, you know, yeah, we don't know that from the data. All we can tell you is the fact that this number has a current temple recommend. We can't tell you what they're thinking. Okay, and, and that's absolutely fair. Well, something I could add to that, because um, Jen is right about the motivation thing. We we see correlations, and then we can infer, right? We could say, well, it might be due to this, or might be due to this. Um, but that's that's all it is is speculation and inference. Um, but something that's separate that could account for that same pattern is we have to remember that this is a a cross-sectional survey that happened at one snapshot in time in fall of 2016, right? So it might be the case that, and people are moving through their their life, right, while while this is going on, it could be the case that we see a higher level of lapsed recommends amongst millennial members because those are the types who are more likely to perhaps disaffiliate at some point down the road. And so in the survey, they would still identify as a member with a lapsed temple recommend, whereas someone who's a Gen Xer or a boomer silent person might have already made that life transition and disaffiliated in terms of their personal religious identity. And so they wouldn't show up in the survey um, as a current Mormon to compare with the millennial generation there. Um, so that's something important to keep in mind as we're, as we're thinking about this. Um, that could just simply be an artifact of people moving through the life cycle and the millennials have had less time 
to do that process of going through the uh, religious re-identification or disaffiliation process. And that's fair. And uh, there's another point in here, and I'm struggling to find it offhand, but uh, one of the respondents did make it uh, well known that she basically doesn't have time with her career, with her kids and everything to go to the temple. Whereas, you know, retired Gen Xers, boomers, so on and so forth, they may have more just actual time hours in the day to be able to go to the temple and, and spend time there. So that can also help to, you know, serve to explain why millennials are maybe not making that time because there's just so much else going on in their lives. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially if they live like outside of Utah or not close yeah. to a temple. Like I know here in central Kentucky, um, for families with small kids to get to the temple and back, it's a it's like a six to seven hour trip. That then if you've got to find a babysitter for like six or seven hours, that's that's no small task, and it's just it's extremely pro- prohibitive from just being able to do that on a regular yeah. basis. Chapter four is an interesting chapter. I want to spend a little bit of time on this because this is single Mormons in a married church. And the focus of the church has really, um, in the past about 70 years, it has really, you know, gone along the trends of what we consider uh, typical conservative party line issues when it comes to, you know, focusing on the family, when it comes to religious liberty, when it comes to many issues that are typically, you know, more conservative talking points. But Along with this comes the uh, the the hard ground to stand on for members who are single, especially as they continue to get older and older in the church. Um, what what are some high level takeaways that we can understand from people who are single members but you know r- remain faithful members, um, and what it says, what the church's culture says about them as single members that you know basically your life doesn't start until you begin a family. Well, I'm so glad you asked about this. This was my favorite chapter to research and to write, my favorite interviews to conduct. So I, am a, I have a bit of a hobby horse with this particular chapter. One thing that is an important takeaway is that this is a growing population within the church. Uh, from Pew's data in 2007 to Pew's data in 2014, we, we saw a 50% rise in the number of singles in the church. That means that they went from 12% to being 18 or 19%, not that it's still a huge number. But we're looking now at one in five adult Latter-day Saints having never been married. That doesn't include the ones that are currently single because of divorce or, or bereavement, just people who've never been married at all, which is a very interesting social change. And it mirrors what's going on in American culture more generally where singleness is, right. is definitely on the rise. People are getting married later. Some people aren't getting at all. So they're not alone is what I would say. But the church has been very slow in responding to their needs as adult members. And it's, uh, it, I have a section in the chapter called the pros of singles wards and a section on the cons of singles wards. Yeah. I, heard I wanted to spend some time on that. Absolutely. Oh, sure. Well, I heard some very passionate uh, attacks and defenses of singles wards. So people have strong <laughs> feelings on both sides. I certainly wouldn't want to be in a position where I had to make the decision about whether singles wards are worth continuing because people are so, so in- invested one way or the other in in that. Okay, so there are a couple of points that I wanted to take out of here because millennial marriage is just happening less and it's happening later and millennials are having less kids. And those are trends that are happening at the national level, as you said, Jenna, but you know, that is reflected as well in the next Mormon survey data that is collected here. So what does this kind of mean for a family centric religion that requires to some extent large Orthodox families in order to maintain its membership? Great question. And I think unresolved, I can give you some speculative (laughs) possibilities, but as far as predicting the future, I don't know. I don't know what the church is going to decide to do about that. I can say that many of the previous strategies have not been helpful, uh, especially for older single adults. One of the people that I interviewed mentioned that they had to do scavenger hunts and throw jello or something at each other as an activity. Mm. And she said, I wouldn't have wanted to do that when I was eight years old. Why would I want to do it now as an adult member of the church? 
And also, I think, a pervasive frustration from some single members that the, the relentless focus on marriage and children in really the absence sometimes of an emphasis on Jesus Christ. You know, someone said, I don't want to go to church if we're just going to worship the family, which was very striking to me. Let's talk about that because that respondent was basically talking about the the infantilization of YSA wards and how there's another chunk in here about, you know, a couple at BYU coming in and, and teaching a group of young single adults when the couple who were married, they were like 21 and 22. They'd been married for a year and a half as if they were some kind of marriage experts to teach these people who may even be older than them about how great marriage is. And and also like as having a married couple who are younger than people attending a social dance being the chaperones because they are married. Um, it, it, it does seem to some extent that some people in young single adult wards do feel infantilized by the way that the church approaches the existence of YSA wards. Right. And, you know, the things that might work for people on the, the lower age end of a young single adult ward, people who are, you know, 18 or 20 or 22 are not the things that are going to necessarily appeal to a 43-year-old who is in a mid-singles ward. And yet we have the, <laughs> same, uh, the same concept for dealing with both of those very different populations. And so if, if nothing else, I hope that there will be more sensitivity to the vast age range of, of really uh, 25 years, because we have people in singles wards from age 18 until they're 44 so that's a huge uh, difference in life stage and where people are spiritually, professionally, in every way. I want to focus on Jamie here because we kind of view, uh, you know, YSA wards and BYU as marriage mills, right? Especially when when the the common throwaway line is used that, oh, yes, she just went to BYU to get her MRS degree. Like I hear that very often. And I want to discuss this as a, a trend within YSA wards. And, you know, somebody like Jamie here who says uh, who basically left the church because she didn't want to or she was having issues with the church um uh you know the way that the church genderizes and treats different genders so on and so forth but now she's decided after studying and learning a bit more about the church and about the culture to date exclusively outside of the LDS pool and this is what she said I just knew that I couldn't stay I did not agree with the expectation that if I was single I had missed the boat now, continuing on with your words, Jenna, now she is in a happier place emotionally and plans to start dating again, non-Mormons exclusively this time. Back to Jamie. I find even a lot of the post-Mormon men that I've associated with, that patriarchal mindset is still very much a part of who they are, and I am looking for a more egalitarian relationship, she says. And then you summarize uh, this, Jana. Several single Mormon women I interviewed mentioned their search for an egalitarian relationship. And I want to discuss how that kind of comports or maybe conflicts with the family proclamation to the world where a man is supposed to preside over his family, but still somehow be equal partnership in marriage, in raising the children, in so on and so forth, whereas the women are supposed to be the nurturers and the way that kind of conflicts with the more millennial progressive mindset of much more egalitarianism where, you know, people in marriages are equal contributing partners to the duties, the chores, um, you know, doing life laundry, raising the kids, so on and so forth. How do we kind of square that? Well, that's a great question. It's pretty clear generationally looking at some of the questions about gender that we have different values in, uh, in the millennial generation, even within the millennial generation, if you divide younger millennials and older millennials, than we do from the baby boomer and silent generation. So things are definitely changing even within the church, questions about how people feel about women not holding the priesthood, this question about whether they prefer an egalitarian marriage or a traditional marriage. Mormons are more conservative than other Americans, most definitely, on gender roles. But younger Mormons uh, are much more like the population than older Mormons are, if that makes sense. That, you know, that gap is kind of closing and I think that we saw in the data that a number of younger women are not necessarily satisfied with the way things are. Another data point that's important to consider 
is that uh, even though we saw many currently identified Mormon women seemingly happy about their role in the church and about women in the church, the flip side of that is that among former Mormons, women's roles ranked for women as the third most commonly cited reason for leaving the church. So what I take from that is that there are many women who are still happy within Mormonism, happy with the way things are, and that's a true narrative. But there's this other true narrative, which is that women's roles were disturbing enough for some Mormon women that that was a catalyst for their leaving. That's kind of the focus of chapter five, millennial women and shifting gender expectations, because the church at a very young age begins to genderize the members and segregate them based on what their gender is. And there's a fair amount of data here, um, and, the, and this is in the subheading Nine Points More Religious, that basically assessed um, certain truth claims, certain theological truth claims that the church holds to, and it shows the difference of men versus women who are confident that they know that something is true. Questions like, Jesus Christ was literally resurrected and rose from the dead. God is real. There is life after death. God has a plan for my life and will be happier if I follow that plan. And on so on basically every single one of these, women are much more confident that they know that all of these theological points are true. But then when it comes to a disagreement of the women's, not only the role that women have in the church, but also uh, that women should be ordained, we see a progression, uh, in an increasing progression of younger and younger generations that more people are not pleased with women's role in the church and leadership and planning in executing activities and so on and so forth. Uh, and because it is, you know, it is a patriarchal religion. So I, I, I'm kind of curious then when it comes to women's beliefs and, you know, especially the more educated women who are leaving the church, um, we see the church shifting in the temple ceremony just this year possibly as a result of a lot of the data that has been collected from their own internal information. Um, we see that there are shifting roles in the church, and I'm just wondering, where does the church need to go in order for people to not feel like they're excluded, especially millennial women? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's a tough one, because... You know, sociologically, you want to maintain a tension with the host culture. You don't want to be just like every other religion that's out there. If Mormonism were to get rid of everything that made it distinctive, that would actually be damaging to its long-term prospects as an institution. However, if people are leaving because it is too distinctive, which it does seem that that has become the case in, in the issue of women, then that is also a problem. So the question is, how do you find that optimal level of tension with the host culture? And this is something that Armin Moss, who is kind of the father of Mormon social science, has outlined beautifully in his book, The Angel and the Beehive. Mormonism, if you look, if you take the long-term historical view, has actually been very adaptable in the past. And so the question Certainly. now is whether with its current bureaucratic structure and its, you know, the fact that we now have the oldest first presidency in all of Latter-day Saint history, um, whether it will be nimble enough to make the necessary changes, but not go too far. So Ben, what were you going to say? No, that's 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 right. That's right along what I was going to to get out there. You've got to maintain that optimal tension in order for it to be relevant and meaningful, and that's historically how the church has been successful and survived. And I guess uh, it's a question of what survival and what optimal survival looks like in each of our minds, and that's something that is you know that that is unique to every person who may consume a book like this or who may view social issues. Uh, through the church's lens, because yes, the church has been adaptable for good and evil throughout the past. And in the 60s and 70s, this is on page 96, um, Janet, you mark the church's extreme shift towards anti-feminism throughout the 60s and 70s as second wave feminism was really beginning to gain a foothold. And um, I'm going to read very briefly. 
Quote, Over the course of several turbulent years in the late 70s and early 80s, it worked to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment, ERA, and excommunicated ERA activist Sonia Johnson. In subsequent decades, Mormon leader statements about issues like working mothers have softened, though the church has continued to define itself by what it calls the traditional family, in quotes. The church resisted a push for women's ordination in the early 2010s, culminating in the widely publicized 2014 excommunication of feminist activist Kate Kelly. It did, however, allow for minor incremental changes in women's role, uh, roles, such as permitting a woman to pray in general conference for the first time, allowing a female leader to sit on one, in on one of the previously all-male meetings at the highest levels of the church governance, and in 2017, expanding parental leave and reversing a policy that forbade female church employees from wearing pants to work. Um, and there's, there's a little bit more about that, but uh, what the what that the way that I read that is that the church is essentially in some ways church leadership has basically uh, demonized these activist groups that are putting pressure on the church to progress and to change and adapt that because of this contrarian nature that the church has to resist the natural world um, that can also cause retrenchment. And I think it is, uh, Armin Moss talks about this, this retrenchment and progression, you know, vacillation that the church has experienced. And it's just, I guess it's kind of hard to tell where we're standing right now on that spectrum of retrenchment and progression, what the church is doing, because, you know, it seems that in some ways it's speaking out of both sides of its mouth here, trying to espouse two, mm-hmm. anti, you know, opposed perspectives. Yes, that is a great point, and it's hard to say. Um, Armand Moss was at a conference in April at Claremont, which was um, about millennials and religion. We talked about this book. We also talked about you know millennial Catholics, millennial Jews, and it was really interesting what he had to say, which was he felt that the, the pace of assimilation and change was accelerating. And I asked him, because I feel the same way, that you know with President Nelson's tenure, we have seen quite a number of of pretty significant changes and also some kind of minor policy changes. What does this mean in terms of the overall thesis? And then at the same time, we're also seeing this uh, move in seemingly the opposite direction, which is expunge the word Mormon from your vocabularies. You know, don't use it anymore. (laughs) That that word has become anathema. And that would seem to be a, a pretty textbook case of the retrenchment part of this thesis. So we do seem to be having both of them simultaneously, but the the bulk of it seems to be on the assimilationist side right now. That is very interesting. Okay, let's let's move on to chapter seven because I think this is one of the most important chapters in the book, and this is uh, the rainbow fault lines. This is talking about LGBTQ exclusion and inclusion and the way that the church has been approaching these because this is and it's even quoted in this book that one of the respondents to the interview says that lgbtq issues are the you know that's the social justice issue of our day that's that is the equality issue of our day of the millennials generation and throughout the survey data it looks like um sexual diversity among Mormon millennials seems to basically follow the national trend. Is that a fairly accurate assessment? Well, it follows the national trend in that millennial Mormons are more sexually diverse than older Mormons, particularly when it comes to bisexuality. It's a little bit different than the national trends in that it is, uh, you know, this is not surprising, of course, uh, a very strongly heterosexual population compared to millennials as a whole. And we also saw that in the former Mormon population, there was more sexual diversity than there is in the current Mormon population. So you're looking there at uh, more like, well, more like one in five who don't consider themselves to be strictly heterosexual. I wonder if we could possibly talk about the Prop 8 effect, because that was a battle that the church waged that was very, very costly, both socially and religiously speaking. And, um, you know, Prop 22 was the beginning. Uh, Prop 8 was the culmination that I, anecdotally speaking, from my inbox, um, doing this show for almost five years, from meeting uh, post-Mormons, secular Mormons at conferences and at get-togethers, Prop 8 was a catalyzing event for a lot of people to leave the church and say that this church no longer holds to my feelings, my system of morality, and I can no longer affiliate with this religion. 
So given the data and given what we are seeing with millennials leaving the church, is there a is there a tangible prop eight effect that can be parsed out of this data? No. Yeah, no. Sorry. Okay. We don't, okay. We don't have any specific question about proposition eight. Okay, that's fair. Uh, and that's stick to the data. I like that. Um but what what we do see also is the softening of the rhetoric because we have in the miracle of forgiveness um, talking about homosexuality. This is untrue as any other diabolical lie Satan has concocted talking about um, homosexuality being something that you're born with. Um, sex, or homosexuality is blasphemy. Man is made in the image of God. Does the pervert think can go, that God can be that way? Um that's miracle of forgiveness, right? That's Spencer W. Kimball coming out of the seventies. The church has since softened, but it really hasn't moved on the hard line that anything outside of heterosexual marriage within the or heterosexual sex within the bounds of marriage is acceptable. This is a big issue for a lot of millennials. This is something that many millennials are instead looking toward their own spiritual, uh, the spiritual experiences, their own conscious instead of to the prophetic leadership for understanding uh, this issue, this social issue. And repeatedly throughout the data, we see that millennials are no longer relying on prophetic leadership. They are ranking it among the lowest of the places that they go in searching for guidance. They are instead relying on their own conscience. And that really seems antithetical to a religion that is high demand, that is top down, that is, you know, very rigidly structured like this. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um I don't, I mean, I take what you're saying and I think that that's a fair analysis for the most part there. Um, the question is just like you point out, right? We've got a very hierarchical authority based religion that on, if you were to take the American religious communities and put them on a spectrum, it's definitely on, um, the authority end of the spectrum, both in terms of doctrine and culture. We also see in the survey, just like you pointed out there from the book, that not every active Latter-day Saint says, yes, I put the words of the church's president as my highest moral authority, or some of them, not a small number actually, are when push comes to shove, they say, I would follow my conscience rather than follow the authority of church leaders. I suppose the question for me is, when we look at the leaders themselves, how would they answer that question? Of course, we don't know. I didn't ask them. You know, we don't have that survey. But that leads to the a lot of the imbalance, I think. We have a very we have yeah, right. leadership which sets the agenda and sets the tone and sets the culture in a lot of ways who I don't think it's unreasonable to argue are far on the authority end of that spectrum, um, but a membership that isn't. And that is a tension that to some degree is going to need to be reconciled. One answer could be, well, there's just simple generational replacement in 40 to 50 years these millennials will then be the church leaders. Um, but at the same time, that's assuming that a random sample of millennials who are in the church now are going to be in the upper echelons of the church leadership in 50 years. And we also know that the types of people who tend to get tapped for leadership positions tend to be those who are similar to the people already there. So my guess is even then that's not just because of social trends and such, my and this is all just speculation on my part, we may see a softening of that authority culture over the next several decades, but yeah. um, I, I bet we probably won't see a huge shift in that. Um, thus, that tension, just like you said, what will happen with millennials as they're continuing to age? Are they going to continue to see that as an acceptable option? Um, maybe not. Maybe some, maybe quite a few will check out and decide that they want to do something else. But it's also important to realize that even authoritarian or more authority, sorry, I shouldn't say authoritarian, even religions that prize authority and institutional um, leadership and such, such as the Catholic Church, um, evangelicalism, although not toward leadership, but more toward a uh, literal reading of the Bible and such, they're also attracting people. Like there are people converting to those religions just as other people are leaving in the huge just shift of American religious fabric. Um, and so that might not 
be a deal breaker for this long-term survival of the church. There might be just as many people who are converting because they're attracted to that sort of thing and they not finding it in whatever religious community they happen to be born and raised in. Hmm. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind with this religions and society and politics are continually in shift and in flux and what is a turnoff for people like you and those who listen to that podcast may be attractive for for others who who might like a community that values certainty and values structure and order um, where they feel at home and at peace and that kind of thing. Okay, I think that's absolutely fair. Um, and I think that's revealed a lot in, in chapter eight when it talks a bit about the, well, I mean, this is part three, passages of faith and doubt. This is getting into navigating religious practice for a new generation. And I thought possibly quite revealing about this is the way that millennials deal with uh, like Word of Wisdom um, and getting tattoos and watching R-rated movies. Um, what did the data kind of tell us about younger generations when it comes to these more authoritarian type of religious decrees? <laughs> In a nutshell, that these are not your grandparents' Mormons, you know. They are, <laughs> uh, they are different. Even high-believing millennial Mormons are less behaviorally orthodox than older Mormons are. So they're less likely, for example, to say that adhering to the word of wisdom is essential to a Mormon identity. And then not surprisingly, they are less likely to be squeaky clean observers of the word of wisdom, less likely to attend church every week. Uh, apparently, we had a couple of different questions on church attendance. Uh, one was kind of in the abstract and one was in the concrete, have you been in the last 30 days? And for older Mormons, uh, there was very little difference between what they said about themselves in the abstract. Yes, I'm a regular weekly church attender. And then, yes, I have been to church recently. For millennials, there was far more of a gap. So on questions like that, it is very interesting that the definition of what it means to be an active Mormon may be interpreted differently. As one young man said to me in an interview, I was very struck by him. He doesn't go to church very often, but he does consider himself an active Mormon. And he said something to the effect of, why would we consider passively parking butts in seats the definition of activity? Why would we consider that to be the definition of an activity? Which is a good <laughs> question when you think about it in those terms. Right. Um, so right. There, there does seem to be a shifting going on here. And it will be fascinating to see going forward whether these less millennial, less behaviorally orthodox millennials will stay in the church and just have that be their new normal, or whether they will find that tension to be kind of intolerable and leave. I found interesting in the, the data as well that you parsed out the, the what, what you consider activity by crafting very specific questions of instead of do you consider yourself active attending um, to have you attended in the past month? And I think it's important to consider activity with regards to the way millennials consider activity, not maybe not necessarily be, you know, passively putting butts in seats <laughs> the way that this respondent said. But somebody like I, I believe there's another passage in here of an interviewer who said, sorry, an interviewee who said that I consider myself more active than many of my, you know, my active counterparts, even though I only attend church maybe once or twice a month. So that's. That definitely seems to point to a very shift, a, a very large shift in the way that millennials see activity in the church. It will be very interesting to observe in future studies. You know, as Ben has pointed out, this is a snapshot in time. And so we can draw some conclusions yes. based on what we have here. But in terms of long term conclusions, particularly when we are thinking about getting our crystal balls out and trying to discern what the future may hold. We need long-term data to be able to do that with any kind of accuracy. Well, and here's the blueprint for it. This is hopefully what will be one among many, many of these, you know, uh, hopefully longitudinal studies that really looks at how this data progresses over time, because taking a single snapshot is useful. Uh, but it's like it's like weighing yourself once and then never stepping on a scale again. You can't really tell much from it if you don't weigh yourself multiple times and get a progression and see the changes that's happening. Um, I like that. Yeah. We're not, we're. 
<laughs> we're we're kind of running short on time. I want to very briefly speak to chapter nine, which is social and political views among current and former Mormons. Um, the chapter begins with talking about the 2016 election and that Trump v. Hillary was a very divisive issue among many Mormons. And basically my overall takeaway, and I think the data, you know, really speaks to this, is that millennial Mormons are just more progressive than former member or that than older generations. Is that a fair assessment? Overall, politically, yes, they are more politically diverse, less wedded to default republicanism, I would say, more open in their views of LGBT issues, but still, and this is a very important caveat, more conservative than other millennials. So it's not that they yeah. are, you know, completely different from other Mormons, older Mormons. They are different, but they are not resembling their peers in many of these political uh, manifestations. Okay. Chapter 10, and, and there's there's obviously kind of a lot that we could get into there, um, but I really, uh, I want to spend some time on chapter 11 before, uh, before you two have to go, and you've both been very generous with your time. Uh, but chapter 10 talks about the re- realignment of Mormon religious authority, and it talks a bit about, um, mil- this is where it really parses out the data of the way that millennials tend to view prophetic and religious authority and where they seek answers when they are stud- you know, dealing with a moral question. And I thought the data there was quite remarkable. Uh, but I want to spend time on chapter 11, Because I feel like chapter 11 is going to be what listeners of this podcast probably most resonate with. And this is Exodus, Millennial Former Mormons. What can uh, what can both of you tell us a bit about those who are leaving the the, what is this Exodus and what is what does the data tell us about Millennial Mormons? (laughs) Well, I think Ben should jump in here. He and I are actually working on this as our next book. So former Mormons. Yeah. Thank you. Former Mormons only get one chapter in this book, which is primarily about current Mormons. But in the next book, they will be the entire mm-hmm. show. Um, I suppose we could say it would be from what we can tell, it would be in it would be oversimplifying things to say that there's one single narrative that fits everybody, right? There's lots of different reasons that people choose to affiliate with or disaffiliate with religious communities. Um, There are some factors, of course, that are unique to the LDS church and to Mormon culture and such. Um, But one trend that we're finding as we're digging more into the survey evidence and also looking at trends from other religious communities and everything is that what's going on in the LDS church is not unique to the LDS church. And I know we said this several times already, um, but religious disaffiliation is simply the trend, uh, like one of the biggest trends Mm -hmm. of um, religion in American society of this generation. Uh, We have a third of millennials now who just claim no religious affiliation, which I think is unprecedented in the last century or so. Um, And so a lot of what we're finding is that there's a couple of big answers, right? One of the big answers is reasons that people are leaving the LDS church are similar to reasons that just young people are just checking out of organized religion altogether. And there's a variety of social reasons that go into that, things like um, just having more options or having it not be as much of a social stigma to say, I'm not a member of a church community, things like that. Also, we're just simply living in an era where Western society in general um, is losing faith in institutions, whether they be economic or political, but also religious. And so that's part of the thing going on um, that affects that. And so one big answer is why are people leaving the LDS church? Well, it's 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 a general life cycle thing. People tend to leave when they, or not tend to leave, but the people who do leave tend to leave when they are young adults or late adolescents. And most of the people who have left um, the LDS church in our survey of former Mormons are those people who who fit that profile very well. The types of people who have left for reasons related to the things that um, the people, say, in your listening audience would probably be interested in, things like... Um, 
getting, uh, finding out about messy skeletons in the church history closet or having fundamental disagreements with church leadership about issues X, Y, Z or things like that. Those are there and they're very real. And the stories in the book that we're discussing focus on that because they're very high visibility, right? But we get in the habit of thinking that's everybody's experience and that's everybody's story when it looks like, and this is still very tentative because we're still mm-hmm. digging into it, but that's not the majority of people. The majority are those just simply going through a standard life cycle effect and subject to the same um, trends that are going on in the wider Western world. Whereas, you know, the people that we're talking about here um, are still there. And that's an important story as well, but it's not the entire story. That's kind of mangled, but did that make sense at all? It did to me. And yeah, I'd like and- to just point out this is so important what Ben is saying that the stories that tend to circulate on social media and the, the people probably listening to this podcast, those are not actually the majority stories. So if you did serve a mission and you did get married in the temple and maybe in your 30s you found out things about the church that started to cause you questions after many years of of very rigorous activity in the church, and then you leave, that may feel like it's a common story because a lot of people who gravitate towards social media affinity groups that have that story have that story, right? That makes sense. But statistically, that is actually not the norm. So your listeners are very special. You can just tell them, wow, you're special. And uh, the norm is that people will leave much younger. And the the people who leave tend to not have been as definitively involved as all in as some of your listeners may have been. That is in no way to diminish their stories. And I think, in fact, their stories are probably considerably more painful than the leaving stories of many people in the national study who left when they were younger and weren't that uh, completely invested in the first place. I want to try and and do my best to speak to that because one thing about your book that I found so remarkable is that there are these the the stories of people who are not members of the survey who are not respondents to the survey but who indeed gave interviews uh 63 of them I believe and they helped to put the human face on the data and I have to admit out of all of them there was only really one person that I ever felt like I resonated with. And I believe that many of the listeners of this show would probably agree that there is very few examples of somebody who I can say, that was me. That was my timeline. That was my trajectory. And I, I understand that the, the people who are, are sampled, the people who are actually quoted, the people whose stories are actually told – are meant to be single representations of broader trends. And we're not supposed to, you know, empathize and truly resonate with every single person in the book. Um, But I do also understand that there feels like there's a huge silence in a lot of this book. And I hope that it won't be a silence in your next book. Uh, But that silence is from the people who hate the church. Mm. From people who are harmed, who are truly damaged by the church, from people who wake up with night terrors from their missions, people who wish and wish and wish that they can bring their family out of the church because they see it as a cult, that they hate what the church does to them, the the wedge that the church drives in their family. There there are many people who I speak with, and granted this is anecdotal, but the entire point of surveys is to collect enough anecdotal data to make it actual data. But there are so many people I interact with, and 120,000 subscribers to the ex-Mormon subreddit uh, at the time we're recording this, and thousands of, of members of hundreds of different ex-Mormon groups who are very vitriolic towards the church. And that perspective, that person, that set of data feels like it is completely absent from the book. So did you collect data like that? Was there any data that you found from people who, um, as, as, uh, there's, there's an acronym of in, you know, the ex Mormon subreddit of burn it the fuck down with truth. There are people who are so mad that they have been lied to that they turn into advocates against the church. Did you find that present in the data anywhere? 
Not in the way that you are suggesting. Um, for one thing, we don't have a question that measures one's level of anger with the church. We did have a question among for- former Mormons to measure their levels of happiness. And the vast majority of, of former Mormons are happy and say that they 93% said that they felt primarily freedom, possibility, and relief after leaving the church instead of anger um, Uh, loss and grief. So looking at that 7%, which is a pretty small minority who may be continuing to feel primarily anger, um, I'm sorry that you didn't find those stories to be represented in the current book, but the current book was intending to analyze people who are still in the church. So that wouldn't have been the place for it. In the next book, that's certainly something that we can consider, but it does not appear to be a statistical majority, even though that is a majority of your audience. Even if it isn't a statistical majority, if it's a significant uh, statistic, then I feel like it should, you know, it it should at least be present and that a lot of readers who maybe feel that way uh, may feel like they are being ignored from um, from not being able to resonate with that data. Um, and not not having questions like that present whatsoever. Um, and similarly, I, I want to read a couple of the statistics here. This is from page 215. You have a graph, a, a pie chart. Um, it, it shows that about 14 percent of people are considered, you know, agnostic or atheists who leave the church. Um, those are people who don't know or don't believe uh, in in God. Then um, there are there uh, there's people who believe, but they sometimes doubt they believe some things they believe in just a higher power, more of like a kind of a vague deism as opposed to a theist or atheist. And then we have people who believe uh, in things, who believe in God with no doubts whatsoever. Uh, that that hits at 42 percent. Former Mormons, 42 percent of them are strong, hard theist. And there's a bit of data in here that may suggest that when people leave the church, that they are more vitriolic or not vitriolic, but more uh, more. Uh, engaged in whatever theological convictions that they found outside of the church. And from my sample size, I also see that there are a lot of people who are very outspoken atheists when they leave the church because uh, Mormonism does a great job of telling you that all of the religions are false. Uh, when you come to the conclusion that Mormonism is as well false, it's pretty easy to say that all religions are false and therefore that any belief in, belief in God is false. Um, so I, I want to, to talk about that data a little bit. What does it say uh, about millennials who leave and their religious beliefs? Well, there are a lot of different questions in what you have just stated. The first is about this issue of atheism. And what I'm hearing from you is that you are uh, maybe skeptical of the fact that so many former Mormons do retain a belief in God. Is that an accurate assessment of what you are feeling? Not necessarily, just more of uh, trying to more holistically understand what the data itself says. And where there's a possibility that selection bias of the populations that uh, shared the the survey and that you were able no, to no, pull from. No, may <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Have... Okay, this is not a social media okay. affinity survey. No one was sharing this survey in social media groups. Wow, we should have established that right from the beginning. This is a nationally representative survey. And that means that it's not something that people link to on Facebook. Am I making that clear? That's such an important distinction. And the reason that that is an important distinction is precisely this kind of question that we are talking about with selection bias. Um, From where you sit, and I I completely understand this, it seems like many, if not a majority, of former Mormons are atheists and are angry because those are the voices that we hear. And those are the people that take the time to listen to podcasts. Those are the people who are invested in these questions still. The people that you don't hear from, however, who are statistically the majority, are the ones who left when they were teenagers. And they're just doing their thing, you know? They're just living their life, and it's thinking about being angry with the church is just not something that they spend a lot of time doing. They didn't know that. Absolutely. Yes, they're just living the life. Right. It is in no way diminishing that you're your listeners have experienced to say that that is not a statistical majority experience. 
like Ben put in perspective with all of American religion, most people leave American religion when they are younger, maybe late adolescence, college age, and sometimes they flit back in, sometimes they flit back out. That's, I think, a little less likely for Mormons because it's such a, an impermeable boundary with society. It's harder to just have those more casual relationships with, uh, with a, a movement that has such high boundaries. But Mormons, former Mormons are more like former members of other religions than they are different from former members of other religions, even though the most visible stories we hear are the outlier, very dramatic stories. Do you know, um, <clears throat> Bryce, one of the interesting variables in, in thinking about like describing former Mormons in the United States, um, whether or not they retain belief in anything versus not, or whether they look for a different religious community or not, um, so far, some of our Mm -hmm. preliminary evidence seems to be that geography makes a huge, huge difference in that. Um, of course, there are other variables that make a difference as well, but generally speaking, the preliminary pattern that we're finding tends to be that for those who live in high Mormon areas like Utah or the Intermountain West, um, that the former Mormons who live there are tend to go more toward the route that you're talking about. They tend to just shut off from religion altogether. They're not interested in joining another religious community. They lose faith in God um, and just kind of go atheist, secular direction in general. Whereas those who live outside of high Mormon areas, when they leave the church, they tend to blend in more to the rest of the American population and society. They tend to believe in God at approximately similar rates to those in the rest of the country. They tend to reaffiliate with another religious community or attend religious communities at roughly the same rates as other people in the United States. And that's really, really interesting to me. Um, and again, we're thinking about all of the things that go into that there, uh, but that might be something to chew on with that. What is it about living around other Mormons that makes it so that when you choose to leave, you go far in the other direction, whereas if you're not, you don't? That is an interesting prospect, and I hope that that becomes a, uh, you know, a subset, a, a sub-focus of the next book, because I feel like there is something to be said to that, and that... While it may not be a majority of people, it is definitely statistically mm -hmm. significant. That is, at, at the very least, that's something that I know to be true. Just, I, it's something I sincerely believe. It's a sincerely a religious belief that I have, um, sincerely held. So, um, it, it's just something that I feel like really requires a lot of parsing, and that it was almost, uh, it was almost teased in this book in, in the <laughs> final chapter, Exodus. Um, but I felt I was so hungry for so much more. I feel like that is that is a field that is white already to harvest when it comes to analyzing statistical Let me data here. here. One reading recommendation for listeners who um, who might be interested. There's a fascinating recent book called Disenchanted Lives by a, a, an anthropologist named Marshall Brooks. And he I don't know him at all. I just read the book and I was very taken with it. So I interviewed him for my blog. And um, basically, he is a, is a never-mo. He uh, grew up without any connection to Mormonism, but his parents moved to Utah when I think he was a young adult. And so he became really interested in these uh, Mormons who lived in Utah. And then for his dissertation, he embedded himself into an ex-Mormon community in Provo, <laughs> of all places. And I think some of the issues that you're talking wow. about are addressed really beautifully in his book. So again, it's called Disenchanted Lives by Marshall Brooks, and it was just published earlier this year, I believe, or maybe late last year. Awesome. Um, so all in all, that's that's essentially where where we come down on chapter eleven. And there's just there's a lot to talk about in this. And there's one point that I want to discuss. It says that you're just offended. You just left because you're offended. Uh, what does the data tell us about uh, people who leave because of that? most people do not leave because they got offended? How's that? Thank you. Okay, yeah. good. Although judgment, the issue of judgment, um, more broadly defined was an issue, particularly for women and for younger people. So right. for women, the issue of I felt judged or misunderstood ranked first. And for millennials, it tied for first in reasons for leaving. Okay. 
Um, that's, that is very important. And a lot of people have a hard time with a, you know, a high sacrifice, high demand religion, uh, judging them and, and not wanting to be judged by that. So I thought that that was a very astute point to make in that as well as, you know, if people do leave because they're offended, it's usually because there's a litany of other issues that are pushing them. And maybe if they are offended, that pushed them over the edge. If there was one catalyzing event. Yeah. And a long time. I mean, one of the things that came through in the data is that for a majority of former Mormons, this was not a quick decision. Um, For most people, it took longer than six months. And for some people, it took years. This book is very important to understanding the current sphere of Mormonism. And I introduced it saying that this is mandatory reading because it is. This is absolutely mandatory reading uh, this is a meter stick of Mormon culture today of the 2010s, and it is absolutely crucial to understand that if you're somebody who's having issues with the church, um, if you're a millennial who has left the church, you're not alone. In fact, you're in the majority, as it seems right now. And if social media uh, and places where you can engage with communities who have left the church feel like a way that you can understand these things from an emotional level, understand these trends and forces that exist in the religious sphere. This book is how you understand those trends and forces from an intellectual perspective. This is the book that is, you know, written from somebody who's standing on a watchtower and observing the rising tide and who is reporting on the actual the actual hard numbers that substantiate that there is a shift in the tides. And it is 1000% crucial to read this book to understand what Mormonism looks like today. And if you are going to have an informed opinion and an informed set of speculation of what the church will look like moving forward, the changes that it may make in the coming decades, and how the church will continue to evolve and adapt and overcome what this mass exodus looks like right now, this book is required reading. You'll find a link to it in the show notes and uh, to to uh, the pages for Jana as well as Benjamin, where you can find contact and information for them and, and everything. Um, but I want to give both of you an opportunity to kind of put a bow on it for everything that we've discussed today, as well as thank you both for spending so much time with us today. Yeah, I don't really have much to add other than we appreciate you plugging the book. Absolutely. It's very kind, and it's been a, a very fun conversation. Thank you for the invitation. Well, thank you very much for having us. It's been a lively discussion. Absolutely. And uh, Jana, it was uh, as well a major pleasure uh, for myself uh, to meet you at MHA and get you to autograph my book. So um, it was it was a pleasure to to finally put a face to all of the articles that I have I've seen read and to uh, – to know, you know, shake the hand of the person who wrote this book. Uh, and it's it's just really a pleasure to spend a lot of time with both of you. So once again, thank you so much. Once again, a huge thanks to Jana Reese and Benjamin Knoll for being so generous with their time and for fielding so many questions that were occasionally nonsensical after I listen back to it. If you don't care for my editorializing or for my comments, you know, go ahead and go ahead and shut off the episode for now because uh, you heard the interview and that's really the meat of this episode. But as for my concluding thoughts, I'm just going to say buy the book. Okay, I'm serious. The Next Mormons is an important book, and it will stand the test of time for decades to come. You know, just like the climate scientist who put up the plaque memorializing the recently lost glacier, this book marks a turning point for the Mormon church. Will the church heed the cries of disenchanted millennials, or will they ignore their next tithing base and fall into obscurity as the millennial generation rises to prominence and leadership on the worldwide stage? A few questions during this interview, uh, based on data within the book, revealed that the data available points to trouble for the church. I deeply respect both Jana and Ben for sticking so well to the data and labeling some answers as speculative during the interview because the data doesn't tell the future and we can't point at motivations specifically. The data points to future trends if nothing changes. My point is, the church will change to answer the call of these trends. 
If the changes that we've seen from church leadership over the past year alone are any indicator of the future, I think we can expect to see the church will be undergoing major revisions in the coming decade of 2020 to 2030. We know that Nelson will be out as prophet in a matter of a few short years. I mean, he's about to hold a massive public celebration for his 95th birthday, right? Dallin Oaks is cracking 90 pretty soon, and the rest of the leadership is hot on their tails. As the older generation of general authorities die off and younger general authorities find their way onto the corporate board, the church is going to continue to adapt and change. What is particularly notable about this book and the survey on which it was based is that This was public information for all to consume, right? This is public data that can now be parsed and understood in ways that point to larger social trends. The trends it reveals are well known within internal data that's being collected by the church. The church knows what's happening. This book allows us as outsiders to see a snapshot of those trends. We simply don't have realistic attendance numbers by the church. We can speculate, but the hard numbers are not there. We can't see if and to what extent tithing numbers have dropped in the last decade as millennials continue to make up the larger majority of tithing income for the church. As more than half of millennials are leaving the church, their kids most likely won't return. Their grandkids have an even lower chance of joining the church. These are exponential trends. The church needs creative solutions to overcome the current mass exodus. And creative solutions don't come from gerontocracies, but creative solutions are nonetheless needed. There are some major roadblocks to change. This is a church which claims to be led by divine inspiration. Any suggestions coming from the sin-ridden reality we all share are simply unacceptable to the leadership. They're adversarial. The leadership has never expressed the required humility, which would allow them to make major changes based on pressure and suggestions from anywhere other than the leadership themselves. These times, they are a change in. As the world progresses exponentially, the antiquated Mormon church will continue to be left further behind. The gap between society and the Orthodox church will continue to widen. The membership numbers will no longer grow. Chapels will be shuttered and sold. Wards will continue to be consolidated. Stakes will be closed. Missionaries will have doors slammed in their faces, not because the people don't want to hear their message, but because the people already know what the missionaries are selling and don't want to be part of it. Mormon church growth in Western countries with educated populations will flatline. Quote unquote, nuanced believers will outnumber Orthodox believers to the point that the older generations will scarcely recognize or resonate with their brothers and sisters in the pew. Society will continue to progress, and the Mormon church, along with its antiquated theology, will continue to become a relic of a dying generation. There are no simple solutions that will fix what's happening. Right? Slightly altering the language in the temple ceremony, softening the harsher anti-LGBTQ policies while leaving the underlying bigotry intact, you know, canceling the red face laden miracle pageant straight from a 1950s John Wayne flick, women being allowed to pray in general conference. I mean, these are all things I've used the analogy of like putting a band-aid on an arterial bleeding wound to describe this before, but even that analogy isn't apt. These are insultingly underwhelming non-fixes to major institutional problems. These small changes, called huge by some, are spitting in the face of a dying population that's been generationally... These small changes, called huge by some, are spitting in the face of a dying population that's been generationally oppressed by a high-demand High sacrifice religion that refuses to admit fault for any demonstrably immoral conduct. We do not seek apologies or give them, doesn't fly in the world that we as millennials are creating. The Mormon church's conduct and policies as they stand are unacceptable. And I stand by what I said near the end of the interview. The information in this book is crucial and it's well worth the read. I also feel there is a glaring blind spot in this book. Subsequent conversations that I've shared with other people who've read it reveals that I'm not the only one who thinks this. 
Honestly, I'm elated that Benjamin and Jenna plan on conducting a follow-up study on why current former Mormons are former Mormons. What data could be collected that would reveal the CES letter effect, the year of polygamy effect, the Mormon stories effect, the ordained women effect, the protect LDS children effect? Right, The monsters lurking in the shadows of this blind spot, the vocal minority from the outside that drives change in the church will have a greater impact on the Mormonism of this upcoming generation than anything the self-proclaimed prophets, seers, and revelators say from the pulpit. What the church will look like when the next ex-Mormons outnumber the next Mormons will truly be a sight to behold. That's going to do it for today. Next week, we are getting back into our historical timeline, and we're going to begin talking about the Council of 50. And I am so excited to share this with all of you. These are big episodes coming up. All right. These are ones, if you have been maybe binge listening or this, you've been listening to this podcast passively, the next few episodes are ones you are not going to want to miss. I'm recording this ahead of time, so unfortunately, I don't have the ability to thank our newest patrons over at patreon.com slash naked mormonism nor does this episode have a patreon exclusive segment at the end of the outro like the most like all new episodes do this episode on patreon.com slash naked mormonism has an extended edition of the interview that i conducted with benjamin and Jana. Uh, there were a couple of questions that it didn't seem to really fit within the purview of the larger conversation and i cut those out but of course people who support the show by giving at least a buck a show or more, you're going to get access to the full uncut interview. And of course, there's a whole bunch of extra content over there. We also do our Nemo book club, our Nemo hangouts, talking to missionaries and a bunch of extra segments. You get an extra episode every week and extended editions of every new episode with the exception of, of course, last week's and this week's episode because I had to record them so far ahead of time because of Sunstone. I promise I'm going to make it up to you patron supporters next week and, uh, you know, give you a, a bit of extra content at the end of next week's episode. But with that, let's go ahead and sign off for the night. If you want to get in touch with me, you can do so at nakedmormonism at gmail.com. Of course, nakedmormonismpodcast.com. You can find all the contact information and the episodes listed there. And if you are unable to support the show at patreon.com slash nakedmormonism. It helps a ton if you leave a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcasting app of choice. That really helps with visibility, and people who are searching for a Mormon podcast have a higher chance of this popping up in their feed. With all of that, I, of course, want to thank everybody who's hung out for us with the entire episode, because you hit the download button. If you're unable to support and rate and review, you still hit the download button, and that's what really matters. So, as always, thank you so much for lending me your ear. Hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. Cast is produced with help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and 
Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast as legal counsel. Music is written and performed by Jason Camo of a aloststateofmind.com and used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.